Supplements are something we've all seen in the market and more likely than not, you've taken them in your life as well. But there's a dark truth to the supplement industry that they don't want you to know about. When I was 15 years old, like many teenagers, I had horrible acne. I went to the doctor again and again and was prescribed cream after cream after cream. And then finally, the doctor recommended a course of antibiotics. And even at that age, I felt that was very extreme. It was just about that time that I found a book in my local bookstore called Natural Cures they don't want you to know about. And everything in it made sense to me. The pharmaceutical industry had been hiding or suppressing natural cures for decades. US regulatory agencies had been conspiring with drug companies to sell more and more drugs. And more importantly, various herbs, supplements, and nutrients were the key to curing supposedly incurable diseases. And so I tried out a lot of what the book said. Exercise, certain dietary changes, certain regimens of supplementation. And guess what? It worked. My skin started to clear up dramatically. I lost a healthy amount of weight. And not only did I feel more confident about myself, but I just felt amazing. And it's experiences just like this that people around the world have every single day. They go to their doctor for treatment that doesn't seem to help and has unwanted side effects. They try an herb or supplement from a book or blog they read and their symptoms seem to improve. So what else can they conclude? Dr. Google was right and their real doctor was wrong. And because it's something so deeply emotional, I mean, we're talking about our health here. The conclusions we make often mirror a religious experience. So what's really going on here? Who's right? And are supplements just one big scam? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. Until 1912, it was still believed that the only nutrients responsible for human health were carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. That's until the scientist Casimir Funk, yes, that's actually his name, discovered that four common diseases at the time, namely beriberi, pellagra, scurvy, and rickets, could be easily cured by supplementing the patient's diets with certain food derivatives. He soon termed these food derivatives vitamins. Fast forward to World War II and nutrition became a top concern for the US government. After all, you couldn't have a bunch of soldiers on the battlefield who were practically malnourished. And that's why today, if you look at the backs of processed food labels and wheat product labels, you'll actually find, yes, supplements listed in the ingredients list. This process is called fortification. We see this with the addition of vitamin D to milk products as well. So we already all take supplements. The real question is, how are they regulated? A lot of people believe that the FDA does not regulate supplements, but that's a myth. In 1938, Congress passed the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which officially regulated food substances such as dietary supplements. But it left a lot of loopholes open for companies to make extraordinary claims about cancer cures, weight loss cures, a bunch of other cures, as well as highly dangerous practices such as hyperbaric oxygen therapy, hydrogen peroxide IV therapy, and coffee enemas. Yeah, it's a thing. And to be fair, alongside the growth of supplement companies looking to make a quick buck by selling outrageous claims to desperate people came some truly legitimate inquiry. After all, there's nothing unreasonable to think that vitamins, minerals, botanicals, enzymes, etc. might have a therapeutic effect on human health. In the 70s and 80s, the Nobel Prize winning chemist Linus Pauling hypothesized that large doses of intravenous vitamin C could be a potential cancer therapy. And actually, the proposed mechanism of action is also pretty reasonable. Some evidence suggests that vitamin C, normally an antioxidant, could could become what's called a pro-oxidant in large doses, damaging cancer cells and leaving normal cells unharmed. Okay, so here's where a lot of people's thinking just gets messed up. We want so badly for this to be true, right? It sounds truly amazing that something so simple, so inexpensive, so non-toxic could be a potential cancer therapy. And in fact, there have even been cases of people who have reported using the therapy, making full recoveries. But as promising as what I just stated sounds, it's just not science. Current evidence of this therapy is still limited to uncontrolled interventions, case reports, reports and observational studies. So then should we be against this therapy? So that's where most of us are asking the wrong question. Science doesn't ask us to be for or against something. That's an ideological question. Instead, science asks us whether more research is needed to come to a conclusion or not. And objectively speaking, yes, more research is needed. And whatever the evidence shows, it shows. Period. Too often the legitimate questions we could be asking about supplements get wrapped up in all the hype about them. And then it just gets so confusing and emotional because once again, we're talking about our health. In 1994, the DeShea Act was passed and it closed a lot of the loopholes from the previously mentioned FD&C Act. And one of the most notable improvements was that it more clearly defined the kinds of claims supplement companies could make. For example, companies can say that vitamin D helps you build strong bones, but they cannot say it cures, treats, or prevents cancer or the flu or anything else. And this is a good thing because we don't want people running around out there claiming there's evidence for something there's not. Which begs the question, who decides whether there's enough evidence? Well, there's the problem. 
Nobody really does. And it's this fact that explains my 15-year-old journey down the rabbit hole of supplement hype and government cover-up conspiracy theories, an experience that is shared by a significant amount of the population. So what do I mean? Well, the FDA reviews pharmaceutical drugs, and pharmaceuticals have a very rigorous process they have to go through to get approved for use by consumers. In fact, this process is extremely expensive. How expensive? The Congressional Budget Office has estimated the research and development cost of a single drug to be anywhere from one to two billion dollars. And so who has that kind of money to fund that kind of research? You guessed it, huge drug companies. Meanwhile, for a variety of reasons, research on nutrition, and that includes nutritional supplementation, remains underfunded by the government, leaving much of this research to a small handful of private individuals, companies, often who have a stake in the outcome. And so a lot of these results can end up being very biased as well. I mean, duh, if I'm a supplement company and I invest a lot into a study, I want the result to be favorable to my brand. So then supplements might have therapeutic effects for diseases, but then they would fall under drug regulation. And then they would have to undergo a lengthy review process, but they don't have enough funding to do so, and so... Do you see the dilemma here? Well, now I can just hear my 15 year old self as well as tens of millions of Americans saying, see, Big Pharma's trying to suppress the truth about all these natural cures for diseases. And it's exactly at this point that we need to exercise the lost art of critical thinking. But it's important to understand what critical thinking is in the first place. To make it really simple, I'll explain it the same way I've always explained it to any test prep student I've taught. And whenever you think about standardized testing, we have to admit tests such as the SAT do at least train people on critical thinking skills. So how do we find the right answer, I ask the student. And I explain, there are many reasonable answers for sure. When we see water on the ground, it could be rain, someone could have been running a sprinkler, or someone could have just dumped water on the ground. All reasonable answers, right? But not all reasonable answers have evidence to support them. So we always have to look for evidence in order to answer that question. But what exactly is evidence? Even that sometimes sounds open to interpretation. Well, in our example of finding water on the ground, we do what's called falsification. We check the weather report to see whether it showed a low chance of rain earlier. We then ask the neighbor whether it was raining earlier and they say it was, etc. We try every way we can to show that it wasn't raining, while we also try every other way we can to show that water wasn't dumped on the ground, there wasn't a sprinkler running, etc. In other words, in order to objectively collect evidence, we have to take the approach of actively trying to disprove our own claim. That's critical thinking. But when it comes to things like nutritional supplements, because it's so emotional, we like to cherry pick our own point of view. We see the news headline that says vitamin E causes cancer or vitamin D reduces cancer risk, and we don't dig deeper. We just use it to confirm what we already believe, which is the exact opposite of critical thinking. Certain supplements have good evidence to support their use while others don't. In fact, a large majority of them don't. But honestly, if we just wait for all the evidence to come in about simple things like healthy eating, we'll be waiting forever to make simple choices. So it's just not practical. So in the meantime, how do we make a rational decision about whether to supplement or not, even in the absence of complete information? Well, when it comes to making a choice like that, we can do a simple thing called a cost-benefit analysis. This is a type of calculation used in decision theory, and it's quite simple. Take the value of the outcome you're looking for, more energy, better sleep, better focus, and multiply that by the probability of the outcome. That value is largely subjective to you. How much do you value it? Better energy, better focus, better sleep. And the probability of the outcome is based on available data, which might be very little. And so on that end, you may have to make an estimation. When you multiply this out, is the number translated to a dollar amount greater than the dollar amount you pay for the product? If yes, then it's reasonable to use it. If not, then don't use it. It's pretty simple. But let's be honest, we don't do this because it's just easier not to. Most of us are not scientific researchers and don't know anything about p-values, confounding variables, etc. And so it's a lot easier to say, here's a convenient conspiracy theory. Which, by the way, would take an incredible amount of cooperation and competence on the part of elected officials. And just think to yourself for a moment if you think that really describes elected officials. The reality is, if we look to the issues of trust in medicine and medical authorities, it's really a two-way street. We saw it during the pandemic when people rejected masks and vaccines, not necessarily because they aren't a good idea for our health, but because they were rebelling against what someone in authority was telling them to do. It's reflected in how I experienced the healthcare system as a 15-year-old. If my doctor had shown more compassion or even discussed lifestyle changes I could make, would it have made a difference to how I perceived claims being made by random quacks who wanted to sell me their book? 
Would small changes in the way policymakers communicate with the public make a difference in whether others looking for solutions gravitate toward claims made by supplement companies that, in reality, could care less about their health? And at the same time, can we enact better oversight of supplement companies that keep this industry transparent and honest? To me, the answers are clear. So are supplements really the scam of the century? Hopefully by now we realize that extreme positions one way or the other are rarely correct. People who have strong feelings against supplementation are just as wrong as the people who have strong feelings about natural cures and government cover-ups. If we keep believing the wrong things and pointing the finger in the wrong direction, it just means we pour less energy into solving the real problems of regulation and the supplement industry, how the public and the medical community are communicating with each other, and the persistent under funding of nutrition research. That being said, while 99% of supplements have almost no evidence to support their use, there is a small 1% that do. Watch this next video to find out which ones those are.